Hello and welcome everyone to TAFE Talks today. We'll just wait a minute or two for everyone to join. Won't be a moment. Hello everyone and welcome. I think we'll kick off. Uh, welcome to today's TAFE Talks on the future of international education in Australia and opportunities for TAFEs. Um, my name's Lyndall Manson and I'm actually stepping in for Jenny Dodd today who was unfortunately unable to join today's session. So before I begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we meet today all the way across Australia. I pay my respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples with us today. I'm coming to you today from Melbourne, which is on the land of the Wurundjeri people. So today's topic is on international education and we have assembled four expert speakers from different parts of the sector for today's discussion. As you know, the National Strategy on International Education was released late last year, and the borders are once again open for international students. So it's a good time now to, to stop and reflect on where the sector is at, what has changed, what are the new directions for the sector as identified in the strategy, and what are the new international opportunities for TAFEs? In terms of the format for today, We'll hear from all of our speakers first, and they all have approximately 10 minutes, give or take each. Then we'll open up the floor at the end for questions from our participants. So just a reminder um, that if you do have a question for one of our speakers, please um, put your question in the Q&A rather than the chat box. Please feel free to use the chat box for your commentary uh, and chat amongst yourselves about any, speak any questions for our speakers um, into the Q&A box, please. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today. We have Alison Cleary from the Department of Education, Skills and Employment. Alison is actually stepping in at the last minute for David Atkins, who was unable to join us. So, so thanks for that, Alison. Um, Alison is the Acting Assistant Secretary in the International Quality Branch of the International Division and is closely involved in the implementation of the new National Strategy for International Education. So over to you, Alison. Thanks so much. I'll just unmute myself as well. Um, look, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak on David's behalf today. They're extremely big shoes to fill, so I apologise in advance for not doing credit to the, the presentation of his that I'm actually looking at. So I understand that um, he his brief was to, to talk today about um, progress on implementation of the Australian Strategy for International Education and uh, including things like the ESOS review, modernisation and uh, micro-credentials, but also to reflect on some uh, opportunities in the VET sector. So to that, I mean, I'll start at looking at the latest of what we know in terms of student arrivals data, because I know that this is of abiding interest um, pretty much to all of our stakeholders. Um, so look, following reopening of the border in December, um, it's positive to hear that over 102,000 international students have arrived. Uh, since late January, the average daily arrivals have steadily increased from 1,000, peaked at around 1,600 arrivals uh, per day at the start of uh, term one, and uh, they're currently sitting at around 1,100 arrivals per day. The total arrivals of both primary and secondary student visa holders from 22nd of November uh, through to 6 March are over 113,000. All, um, and these are all uh, fully vaccinated students and uh, students have to continue to adhere to uh, Australian government and border requirements and so forth. Moving on to uh, diversification, I mean, as you would all know, a key objective of the strategy is to drive increased diversification, um, including not only of cohorts, but also of product offerings uh, to improve sector resilience and the student experience. And um, 
I would actually no, I won't pour I, in David's notes. He's uh, reflected on the diversification uh, paper, which basically uh, goes to the university experience. So I'll move on from there, uh, because whilst it, it does focus on uh, Australia's public universities, the objectives of it enhance student experience and business resilience, and the roles that diversification can play are relevant across the sector. And so what we're seeing is that uh, there's a, a strong response from the universities, but I think we would see something similar across all sectors in, in terms of their response to the idea of diversification. Um, a range of views, some very strong views, um, but broadly there's a support for diversification. I think that where the differences come in is how that should be achieved and the roles of governance uh, versus um, institutions and how that can be achieved. Another important initiative um, that has come out of the uh, Australian strategy is the ESOS review. And um, this is a much more comfortable territory for me because this is indeed the part of the work that I'm leading on. So the, the review of um, the ESOS framework is a short and targeted review. Um, whilst um, you know, past reviews have been uh, quite ambitious in looking at the entirety of the framework. What we're doing this time is to focus on the, the areas of the framework that most need attention to be uh, uh, to update it, to be more responsive to the ambitions in the strategy, but also to reflect um, what we learned during the pandemic and to reflect on, um, you know, basically what has changed uh, in the in the sector more broadly since the last review and since um, ESOS was introduced back in 2000. So the discussion paper, which I'm hoping that most of you will be familiar with, has uh, introduced a range of um, subject matter that um, DESI regards as being a, a first instalment, if you will, um, of changes that uh, we're, we're looking at in response to issues that were raised uh, during um, the consultations on the national strategy, but also in broader discussions with stakeholders and in correspondence as well. And so what you're seeing is that, that increasing focus or a continuing focus rather on diversification, on quality, on innovation. And um, we've been having some really good engagement with the sector so far. And um, in terms of, of those issues, we're seeing particular interest um, around uh, things uh, like uh, the, the the changes that we're looking at in terms of student agreements. Uh, I think that there's an opportunity here for us to look at the balance afresh in um, the relationships and the uh, balance of responsibilities between providers and students. And so there's been some really good dialogue that we've been having on that. There's also been some really good engagement as people are looking at what we learned in terms of the pivot to online delivery during the pandemic and what does that mean, not just for delivery uh, perhaps uh, of online content to students who are on a student visa, but also our ambitions to deliver more online and offshore to uh, in our TNE markets. And so we're looking forward to continuing the dialogue um, with, the state, uh, with the sector on this um, and stakeholders like yourselves, not just in conversations like this one, but also in the, the workshops and uh, webinars that we'll be having um, toward the end of, end of this month and into April as we get, you know, delve more closely into these issues. And we're gonna be settling um, the schedule for those um, workshop and webinars shortly, and we'll be providing details to T TDA as a key stakeholder to share with members such so that people can continue their participation. In terms of um, you know, other opportunities that um, arise out of the strategy, um, we think that um, the uh, the International Education Innovation Fund and the projects which were uh, announced in the end of February offer some more initiatives uh, that give the opportunity for vet sector and, and stakeholders to get involved. I mean, the, the $10 million um, EIF, it gives the, the sector support to reach new markets and pilot innovative new products and to align educational opportunities with Australia's identified skill shortages. So that's the, the focus that you'll see coming out through the strategy and that's been driven home through the allocation of projects in the fund. So I'd, I'd like to draw um, stakeholders' attention to uh, the micro-credentials project, for example. Now this is, um, the project here is piloting a set of micro-credentials in the VET sector, targeted international students to meet identified skills gaps. So this goes to that idea of diversification of product offering. And the idea is that the initiative will deliver a report comparing 
our skilled workforce, that's Australia's work, skilled workforce and training needs against the study profile of international students and course offerings. And that's about um, identifying how the sector can address future skills gaps through the development and delivery of micro-credentials. So pointing the way to where the opportunities um, might exist and augmenting existing market intel. It's also going to develop country-specific handbooks to guide VET providers looking to diversify their offshore offerings and deliver into different countries and to support them to meet the requirements for online face-to-face -face and blended delivery of micro-credentials. Another initiative looks to deliver critical skills courses in partner countries, supporting Australian education providers to expand offshore delivery and build partnerships with industry. Now there's two uh, components to this. It's going to be across um, two of our source markets or key markets, uh, LATAM and in India. And uh, basically the, the idea of the project is to work toward delivery of um, pilots, of um, uh, new qualifications that are designed and delivered um, to meet skills needs in different um, uh, critical sectors in those in those source uh, in those pardon me in those markets. So in India we're looking at agriculture, and in LATAM it's the the target is mining, and the idea is to um, identify skills needs and as I said um, work to develop appropriate um, occupational standards and courses that actually deliver on those. Um, there's going to be another initiative piloting innovative transnational education products to help Australian education providers to identify and leveraging uh, emerging offshore opportunities. And this is about identifying industry pilots of innovative TNE in the tertiary education sector and support their delivery and ongoing monitoring and evaluation. So we're looking for trends and opportunities and challenges to expand TNE and develop resources for Australian education providers to navigate the regulatory settings, governance arrangements and processes for TNE in key market, uh, key partner countries. Now we're looking um, in, in terms of how these um, projects will proceed and um, how people can get involved. There's going to be a, a range of procurement methods being deployed to progress the initiatives and in some of the projects have already gone out into market and uh, basically the way we're going to procure is going to vary depending upon the, the size and the specific requirements um, and uh, the expert on procurement panels available to the department and, and some time and considerations. So several initiatives though, we're going to be looking for um, outreach and commissioning of work from within the sector. And we'll also be establishing some advisory panels um, to support the development and delivery. And so we're looking forward to working with you to progress them and seeing that the benefits that we can uh, drive for the sector together. So I do encourage members um, if, if it's of interest to you and you get the opportunity to become involved in those projects. So in terms of um, the, the last initiative uh, from the strategy that I was going to mention was um, the PRISM's data modernisation. So this, um, as members may well know, was a uh, project which was, or an initiative which was announced in the, the MyEFO statement and includes $17.3 million as a pilot to modernise PRISMS. Um, someone pointed out in this morning's stakeholder meeting that PRISMS is actually uh, uh, 22 years old. Um, which I thought was quite stunning. I had realised it was quite the veteran, but perhaps not quite the, as much of a veteran as that. So PRISM's modernisation, um, this is pilot funding, which focuses on how we can streamline the input of data from providers into the system and to eliminate the need for double data handling from you know, providers putting the information into their own system and then having to undertake a separate exercise in order to make um, information available to PRISMs. So it's really, you know, in terms of lay people like myself, it's about building pipelines uh, through which data can flow in an automatic fashion. Um, I know and I've heard quite a lot of discussion from various stakeholders about other things that they would like PRISMs to do, but um, at the moment that is the focus of that project um, and I think there's clear consensus that it's, it's, it's welcome and helpful, um, but um, you know that there are other, other things that uh, PRISMs might be able to do in the future, but um, it will uh, have a strong deregulatory uh, effect and we're hoping will um, you know, improve the lives of the providers who are needing to work with it. And uh, lastly, I've been asked by um, colleagues in um, our partnership branch to mention the uh, some opportunities in uh, in Indonesia. 
And one of those is the Catalis uh, TVEC Clearinghouse, which is a single skills database facilitating commercial partnerships. And the second of these is the APEC and Pacific Alliance Occupational Standards Project, which is operating in Chile, Peru, Mexico and Colombia. And uh, they're looking at um, occupational standards for around cook, housekeeper and infection control. And so the, uh, the opportunity here obviously is for us to, to, to assist in the development of those standards, but also to think about how we might influence them in a way that's supportive of our pr own providers into the middle and long term. So I think um, that is the end of the notes that I have from David, for which I am profoundly grateful. Um, I'm very happy, uh, depending on how you would like to structure the section, uh, to take questions now or, or later. Um, and uh, we'll answer those to the best of my ability, once again, noting that I've got some very big shoes to fill today. Thank you, Alison. Yes, we'll, we will um, do a Q&A session um, at the end of all of our speakers. But thank you. We really appreciate Lovely. stepping in today. Um, and we also appreciate um, your offer to, con to continue the dialogue um, around the implementation of the strategy and, and some of the projects that you're, you're working on. And TDA is, of course, happy to, to get the word out about any um, consultations or workshops that are upcoming. So thank you. Uh, so I will now uh, introduce our next speaker, um, Janelle Chapman, who probably doesn't need an introduction, but for those of you who don't know Janelle, um, she's a leading expert in international education and particularly in VET, with more than 30 years of experience in the sector. Janelle is a VET expert member on the National Council for International Education and is the president of the International Education Association of Australia. Janelle is also the executive director at the Australia Pacific Training Coalition, an Australian government initiative managed by TAFE Queensland. So over to you, Janelle. Thanks very much, Lyndall. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'd like to um, present to you my commentary, which is um, the brief that I was given, but underpinned by me being the VET expert member for the Council for International Education. Um, my 33 plus years um, working for TAFE Queensland and in the, the VET sector, and also my understanding of you know, the, the consultation processing imp implementation process that occurred with the new national strategy for international education. As you can probably imagine, it was very lonely as a, a VET expert member on the, the Council for International Education, and, um, and it was often very loud voices from the higher ed sector. So for me, it was very important to be able to get the views across of both VET but more importantly, across for TAFE, to understand what our concerns are and our issues, to make sure that they were included in the, um, in the overall um, national strategy. I know that many of the TAFEs around the table here were involved in the consultations around the strategy, and, um, and it's important that those views were listened to and heard. So moving on to the next slide. So Australia is now reopening, you know, we do celebrate the fact that we're an open pluralistic country, but obviously COVID-19 has caused us to really look internally. In the last couple of years, we've had the ability to be able to look at the way we do things and to then investigate other ways or new ways of doing things in this new post-COVID world. Well, it's not a post-COVID world, our existing COVID world. There's certainly been a lot of change and uncertainty, and it hasn't helped that we've had very mixed messages going to our international students over the last couple of years. Everything from go home, right through to now offering, you know, full student visa rebates, uncapped work hours, and a new three-year minimum post-study work right visa. You know, those messages and those mixed messages have certainly um, not helped us in the global arena in lots of ways. Um, I will say that many of the comments that I'll make to you today are personal commentaries, so please don't hold any of my employers um, to these. But it is important that I think we do look at things in a very objective way and, and really have a good understanding about how it has impacted TAFE and what the opportunities are for us in the future. So obviously our geographic location causes us to be over-reliant um, from the Indo-Pacific region. Now that's a great thing because we're working closely with neighbours, but it also then puts us in a high risk category when we have issues that don't allow those people to come in. 
So for 2019, the top three sources were China 35%, India 17 and Nepal 13%, and then followed by Malaysia, Vietnam and Pakistan. There has been much concern over the last um, couple of years about the fact that um, one of our biggest markets with China, where the students might become very comfortable in doing offshore and online and not actually want to come back to Australia, that it might be too high risk for them. Um, and so that's something we really need to be cognizant of. Thank you. So next slide, please, the new opportunities. So the National Council brings together seven federal ministers and chaired by the Education Minister, plus 11 expert members. And it's really important to note that this is the first time that we've been able to get all ministers involved in the same room, in the same forum, with a view to looking at making the international education and training sector much more um, prominent in the eyes of both government and our communities. It acts as a conduit for the important issues, but probably over the last year or so, its most important um, um, remit has been about developing the um, National Strategy for International Education 2021 to 2030. And there was much talk about why we needed a 10 year strategy. Those of us who've been in the sector for a long while know that it is a, an ever dynamic sector and things change continually. But if we don't have that long-term view, we will miss out on opportunities, that we need to have the foundations in place to be able to reach the outcomes that we need. So we looked at the, implement, uh, the development of this strategy as a short term to deal with COVID and then also as the long-term view to make sure that Australia maintains or increases its global presence in this industry. So there are a number of things that are being implemented and all of these are underpinned by the very important um, component that students are at the centre. So whatever we talked about with our national strategy, students were front and centre of all of our decision making. TAPES do this really well. So that worked really well for, uh, for me on the council, but it also meant that I could bring some case studies to the council that, you know, allowed them to see that, you know, best practice with, um, you know, having students at the centre. For those of you who know me well, they will know that student diversity is um, a soapbox that I have long been um, um, on. And I believe that um, to have good student diversity is just mitigates our risk on a whole range of reasons and also gives a better outcome for the student experience when they're studying um, at any of our um, institutions. One of the first things that was developed was um, the international student diversity um, idea. Now, from a public university point of view, this caused great resistance and reluctance to want to be involved in. But we finally won over a long period of time just to to make sure that we have this mandate that to have better student diversity means that we will have better resilience in the sector, but also more importantly, again, coming back to that positive student experience. So if you look at your source markets and look at the types of programs that you're offering and have diversity within those two things, as well as where students are studying across Australia, whether it's metro or regional, then the student experience overall will be much improved. That discussion paper um, um, is allowing for submissions up until the end of April. So from a, a TAFE point of view, it's probably more about the impact of the pathways. You know, if, if there are student um, or if there are universities close to you, that you have a pathway um, with, then it's probably important for you to understand what their thinking is around this student diversity um, issue. Second thing, major thing was the review of the ESOS um, legislation to make sure that, you know, that it works for us. In this post-COVID world, we have to be able to deliver online. We have to be even more innovative in our teaching and learning. We have to be able to ensure that our transnational partnerships, our offshore campuses, um, are able to work effectively and not be hindered or have roadblocks in any way. So this is a really um, important part of the strategy to have this review. 
The third one I think is really important. You know, um, we talk about micro credentials now, but you know, 20, 30 years ago when I first started in, in TAFE, we talked about skill sets. And it is about skill sets still. You know, it's about having a micro credential that recognizes the skill set that is industry focused, that relates to industry outcomes, that relates to employment outcomes. This is our bread and butter and take and always has been. So to have this as a recognised way um, of a pathway into a program will actually be a great thing for the TAFE sector. And I think it's really important that we are very vocal and loud in our, um, in our um, acknowledgement of these micro-credentials that meet the needs of, um, of um, industry are a really important component. Alison talked at length about the International Education Innovation Fund, and there are some um, important um, aspects of that that are very um, relevant to TAFEs. Um, but it is, you know, the fact about supporting the student engagement best practice is, again, students at the centre. You know, I'll keep coming back to this. If we don't have students at the centre of whatever we're doing around the um, engagement with the strategy, then we're not meeting the needs that we do need to, to meet. So the next one. So what are our opportunities? Um, I'm a firm believer in the International Skills Training Program and, um, and there are many TAFEs um, who are in this forum today who are part of that. Um, I think it is a great way to be able to give some um, skill sets to people who are delivering in the vet sector um, across the world. We, um, as TAFE Queensland, we have trialled this and piloted this um, program in a range of different countries from the Pacific to um, Latin America to Asia, and it has always had incredibly positive feedback. Um, it gives people some tools to be able to work with to actually increase their level of competency and capability um, within delivering VET. Um, so I'm a firm believer in that one. But we do have this innovation fund now. And Alison did talk at, um, about a range of these options, but I think some are more applicable to, you know, what are right for TAFE as well. So I talked about the barriers and, and opportunities with the diversification angle. That again is important to understand how our pathways from the TAFE programs might fit into the universities that you already pathway into. And if they change their diversification um, strategy, then how will that impact on you with your pathway into those programs, depending on your source markets and things like that? Um, expansion of the offshore delivery through TNE, obviously really important. And all of those areas there are areas that um, a lot of TAFEs are very much involved in and very focused on. Um, so it is important that we do have a clear understanding about what the regulatory environment is, what the governance arrangements are for those particular geographic areas. Again, that alignment of the international education with skills needs through micro-credentials, you know, we've been talking about it for years and years, and, and now we've got the opportunity to actually pilot, you know, um, a set of VET micro-credentials that will work for us finally. Um, so, you know, I would encourage all of you to be part of that um, process. I will talk more about this later, but the other part of this is that the opportunities for TAFE are there but we need to start working together. We need to start working more collaboratively to be able to then match the size and volume of the university um, sector. You know, we are going to be playing in the same space as them in lots of ways, but we have the ability to be able to work together and we have such long history and, and long experience in being able to, to, you know, understand how to be responsive and reactive to what's needed in industry. And the last one I'd like to just highlight again is that promotion of the student engagement best practice. TAFEs have been very good at doing this for so many years. And I think we just don't educate people enough about what our strengths are in this way. You know, there are some great case studies around Australia about, um, you know, um, best practice with student engagement. But, you know, again, it is about just educating the community and, and other parties about what that looks like. Thank you. Next slide. So from, if I put on my president of the International Education Association of Australia, one of the things that we're doing um, in particular to, to meet the needs of the national um, strategy, again, student focused, is that post-COVID focus on student welfare. You know, 
we say that student welfare is important. We know that they've been impacted um, from a mental health point of view, like we all have over the last couple of years. What are we going to do about it? So IEAA commissioned a student voices survey in late 2020, and it was the first time that Australia and New Zealand worked together on this to actually um, I determine what the student opinion was about their international peers. But was getting the domestic student voice in both Australia and New Zealand about how they thought international students were coping with what was happening when the borders first closed, when they you had some students still here, you had a lot of students who couldn't get back into Australia to complete their study. So it was a really good um, insight into how domestic students um, thought. And that obviously is then a sample of what our communities think about international students themselves. IEAA works very closely with the Council for International Students in Australia, or CESA, and again, it's to listen to their voice, to listen to what they need in a national strategy, to listen to what their key issues are. And the president of CESA also has a seat on the, the National Council for International Education. It is important that we recognise that both education institutions and the national strategy are prioritising mental health support. For those of you at the cold front, you'll know that over the last couple of years, that has been one of the most concerning and disconcerting things, watching students go through essentially hell, being away from home, not being able to get back into the country, this, you know, not, not being able to feed themselves sometimes. The stories are horrendous and they will be long lasting. We need to make sure we don't forget that it's not going to be just a short term impact, that there will be a long term impact for this. And it will probably create some resistance for some students not to want to study overseas because they've lost that sense of security. Mm -hmm. IEAA has paid for a public relations campaign to educate the wider Australian community on the benefits that international students bring to us. And it's not about the economic benefits. This is about what um, the international students bring to our communities, you know, and the theme is helping Australia thrive. And it is about educating your local community member about how important it is to have international students here. They are not taking the jobs of um, our domestic students, of our sons and daughters. They are actually helping to meet the skills needs gap. So it is important just to be very clear on that. So next slide. So looking forward, there will be new opportunities for TAFE. TAFE must be nimble and responsive to emerging trends, something that's sometimes hard to do, but many TAFEs have worked out a way to kind of have an arm of their um, TAFE institution that actually can be responsive and more nimble to what business needs are and to what the industry trends are. We have to play in the same space as the universities and we need to find our mark. We need to find our patch of turf. We need to work with the university sector as well as the other sectors involved. But we do have to be aware that they are very strong, very large in volume and often very loud. So we need to make sure our voice is heard. I'll go back to the point that I firmly believe we have to um, collaborate, not compete. We have often a history of competing with one another and that does not help us in the, um, in the global space. It does not help our reputation in the um, Australian or national space. We have to be seen to be working together to educate people that TAFEs can do this work and can meet those skills needs. You know, and my last point, not everything will be easy, but it never has been for TAFE. It's always been a hard slog. Um, I just think we can work better together um, and, and we can achieve outcomes that are needed. So happy to take any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle. Um, that, that was great. A really good sort of big picture um, summary of where the sector's at. Um, I think that the key takeaways that I took from that is we have to put the students at the centre of our decision making. And I think it's important as well, the point about we need to collaborate not compete. So thank you very much. Um, I will move on in the interest of time. Um, I'd now like to introduce Helen um, Kronberger, who is the Manager of International Education in Global Engagement at Austrade. Helen's role includes the promotion of the Australian international education sector, including VET, globally. 
and monitoring the sector's trends internationally. So over to you, Helen, and you have um, approximately 10 minutes. Thanks, Helen. Thank you so much. And please feel free to kick me under the table if I go too long. <laughs> um, so it's an absolute delight to be with you and to be on this panel. And as has been said, we have two core roles at Austrade to lead the global promotion and reputation management of Study Australia, that's in, with and by Australia, and to support Australian education, training and service providers to grow and diversify. And by diversify, we mean not only reducing dependence on a limited number of student source countries, but also diversification of study locations within and outside of Australia, modes and models of delivery, courses, fields of study and new learner types. So we continue to work closely with states and territories through the Study Australia Partnership to promote all that Australia has to offer onshore across all metro and regional locations. And we see TAFEs as really central to this diversification agenda. Next slide, please. We're all too familiar with the direction of these graphs and the challenges they continue to represent. The sectors faced halted mobility, intense competition from other destinations globally, and the need to regain market trust and confidence. And I'm sure the impact felt at each TAFE needs no explaining by me. Despite the pandemic, however, IDP research shows that nearly 80% of prospective students are still committed to studying abroad on campus and we're seeing deferments falling. Next slide, please. So what about VET? VET commencements were down, as you would be aware, by about 16% in 2021 full year and the VET sector recorded the largest share of commencements. So we VET was at 49% for 2021 overall, with 90.8% of the student visa holders onshore. It's the largest proportion for any subsector. And according to the graph on the left, courtesy of Desi, I do like this one, 41% of students enrolled in the VET sector in 2021 had undertaken a higher education qualification immediately prior to their VET course. So VET as capstone and as pathway, including in an offshore context, is one to explore further. And almost equal numbers of students went into a VET program as into a higher education one following completion of ELICOS. So it's going to take some time to rebuild that pathway. The success of rebuilding onshore will be really dependent on perceptions of value for money and access to meaningful and relevant employment opportunities and no news there for you. Next slide, please. The graphs that are going up involve new modes and models of delivery. So students have more study options than ever before and demand for online learning was already rising prior to COVID. And I can just feel the range of reservations on your part and see the eyes rolling, but bear with me. Rest assured, we believe that the traditional onshore model will continue to be sought after and we are very focused on that. We also expect that t &E will continue to play a role and there's evidence to suggest an increased interest in t &E hub countries with foreign campuses like Singapore and Dubai. Australian t &E programs, including TAFE programs, are perceived very favourably and you all know why. And despite the challenges of online vet delivery, TAFEs are building a reputation as world leaders now, not just in in-person delivery, but also in online. Online qualifications are attractive to some learners, and that's including via study centres that provide a campus or peer-to-peer -peer or cohort experience near home. And we do expect that closer to home as a starting point with a shorter time abroad will remain popular for a range of reasons. And as always, beyond onshore, in-country, for-country training produces graduates that help fill skills gaps and support socioeconomic development goals. And offshore Australian options will continue to offer pathways to onshore as they're designed to. There's also been a rise in demand for online executive education, direct to industry training and even industry partnerships that include continuous upskilling subscription models. And we acknowledge that product diversification, especially in terms of online short courses and micro credentials requires scale. And even the development of very short courses can be resource intensive. Price point matters and market expectations regarding the cost of tuition do vary. And I note the projects that Alison has mentioned and everything that Janelle has said also. Next slide, please. Overall, 
Our global network is reporting continued demand for study in Australia. Travel restrictions have lifted as we've heard and students are returning. Our posts also observe increased demand for locally taught t &E in China, Taiwan, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Japan and South Korea, among other locations. And our networks also advise that demand for online delivery is growing in Colombia, Mexico, South Korea and Sri Lanka. In China, there's a lot of goodwill based on past training initiatives and partnerships. There's also a growing gap in the Chinese labour market, a surplus of university graduates lacking the technical skills needed for China's focus on technology intensive manufacturing and services. And at the same time, China's VET system remains underdeveloped in, in infrastructure and curricular terms with a shortage of teaching staff. Under recent key policy documents, China's VET sector is directed to pursue greater international collaboration with quality partners, including on education and training standards and exchange of personnel. And I fully acknowledge that there are challenges just at the moment in the inability to be in country and also uh, the ongoing challenge of price point for courses that are in lower paid professions. But VET joint programs that offer time in Australia with a lower cost for students overall, so some at home and some in Australia, appear well suited to the market at the moment, and even more so where there's a pathway to higher education. There's also scope for shorter non-AQF courses that are recognised by employers and for train-the-trainer curriculum development and consulting services. So for sectors of focus, I would refer you back to Austrade's China Skills heat map, which is still current, but you're looking at early childhood, tourism and hospo, health and aged care, mining resources, food safety, ag and advanced manufacturing, among others. In Pakistan, the demographics are very favourable. There's strong involvement, as you would know, um, by Germany and other European aid partners in the TVET sector, especially since 2011. And future training opportunities are going to be focused on large scale trainer PD to lift technical skills, build capacity and create master trainers, TVET assessors and management teams. TAFEs have opportunities, including partnerships with in-country institutions, nothing new there, as well as in-market delivery, offering pathways towards study in Australia and bidding for large scale TVET teacher training and upskilling projects. So I just moving around the globe a little bit here but in Kenya there is significant uh, there's a significant reform agenda around skills so the first uh, cab off the rank for Kenya has been to look at RPL the country has a very young population with high youth unemployment and there's a new reform agenda to try to align the TVET sector with the country's industry needs there's a new national TVET blueprint awaiting approval at the moment so opportunities there include capacity building, there's digitization of the TVET curriculum, virtual and online training programs, and even the delivery of training in rural Kenya through uh, mobile training units, providing access and equity programs for learners with a disability. In Japan, um, sure, it's true, most international student enrolments uh, in terms of Japanese student enrolments are from onshore students in Australia into TAFE. So these can be working holiday or LACOS students, but there are other programs and opportunities to explore. One of those is virtual study tours and face-to-face -face study tours. They can be anything from um, a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, a few months. There's, there's a lot of options there to explore and they can focus on a specific study area such as global citizenship or the UN SDGs. You could look at offering study abroad semesters in the form of a Cert 3 at a TAFE during a Japanese qualification so that there's a, a, a double badging there in areas such as early childhood, business, tourism, or even ELICOS. Student recruitment directly. Um, it's important, we think, to position TAFEs as a competitor to US community colleges. I know that's not a new idea elsewhere, but it hasn't really been done well in Japan yet, and we think it could be. And student recruitment into TAFE degrees, because there's certainly a lack of awareness that TAFEs do deliver degrees and as a direct competitor to New Zealand in that regard. In South Korea, short term training, internship placement programs under the government funded global field trip and global internship programs. There's the, the uh, partnering with a local provider through joint diplomas, direct student recruitment into courses leading to employment. In the Pacific, um, very broad considerations. 
I'm Sorry, almost Helen, done. I promise. Just... <laughs> oh, okay. Just to let you know. Yes, your one minute warning. Thank you, Helen. Sorry. Thank you. No worries. Um, I, Alison's covered LATAM, South Asia, keep an eye out for new announcements, Indonesia, India and Vietnam, the broad range of opportunities under quite comprehensive free trade agreements that include uh, skills training and education. And I would just note that um, Austrade has a whole range of new initiatives at the moment. I'm very happy to tell you about them, but we've just hit our uh, 1.28 billion impressions delivered globally since July last year. We're working overtime to promote you and your offering and to send students to you through the course search function. And if you want to register for our new partner hub, it's for agents and providers and has a whole raft of resources and marketing toolkits there with more to be added, including data insights. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, that was really interesting seeing some of the trends, um, the trends there and, and the rise of online learning and um, opportunities in, in places like Kenya. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'll now move to our next speaker, uh, who is Andrew Williamson. Andrew is the Executive Director of International Education and Enterprise Solutions at Holmes Glen Institute in Victoria. He was also the former head of the Victorian TAFE Association. Andrew oversees the international activities of Holmes Glen. So over to you, Andrew. I think you've got about seven or eight minutes, so you might have to talk quickly. I do apologise. Thanks, Andrew. Blimey. Thanks, Lyndall. Um, one of the one of the advantages of, of coming at the end is that um, is that uh, and, and really the reason for me being here is to sort of talk about the TAFE experience. A lot of what has already been said is is playing out inside our organisation. So so some of what I'll do is just recap about what it looks like in uh, in Homes Glen at the moment. Um, let me see if I can get this thing to move. Um, Okie dokie. Here we go. And I'm not getting it to move, which is not going to do well for my time. Andrew, also happy to. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. So quickly about uh, international onshore. Look, we, we anticipated that we wouldn't get a flood. It would be a trickle uh, and we've got a trickle, but it's a trickle with promise. So uh, we've got about 20% of the onshore students that we had pre-COVID, um, but we're getting about 50 applications a week. So we think this is good. We budgeted low this year and uh, so we're... Um, we're currently over delivering, which is terrific. Um, we know that there's enormous global demand out there at the moment, um, uh, but there's also a lot of competition. So uh, we, we're inserting ourselves into that competition. We, we've spent COVID, we've reviewed all of our source markets, we've done a whole heap of market analysis, and we've we've decided that there are some new markets that we want to go into, and we're getting some early success in that as well. Uh, we know that COVID's been very bad for uh, our agents. It's been very hard for them. And so we've kept those ne networks warm so that they were ready to, to send us students as soon as our borders reopened. We've reviewed our offshore pathways programs um, and, and we've gone back to some of our existing partners and asked them, well, how can we improve the pathway process so that, so that the initial work is done offshore, as you know, but then, uh, then we get them um, pathwaying through to us here in, in Australia. And we have been looking at those new delivery models um, that have been mentioned by a couple of different speakers, partially delivered offshore, partially delivered onshore, uh, use of new technologies and, and so forth. For those students that we've had who have been current, who are already onshore or already enrolled with us, the challenge for us at the moment is um, is the lure of full time work. And we've had students come to us and say, "What does the government want me to do? Do they want me to work full time or study full time?" And and there's there's not really the uh, scope to have them study part time and work full time at the moment. So the lure of full time work is a challenge. Um, we we have flipped a lot of our current students throughout the COVID process uh, period to. Uh, move from one qualification to another and our alumni network has been especially helpful uh, in that and the other group that we have found um, a, as an interesting source has been the uh, the set of uh, folk who've been on post-study work visas that the, the visas started to expire and then they're moving back into study 
In terms of our offshore, I've divided this up into opportunities and uh, and and threats. Um, the new the new models we had to we had to evolve our models during COVID to do more stuff uh, remotely, and we also had to evolve our partnership uh, roles, I guess, in in uh, so that the the local partner was doing more to ensure that we had a high quality student experience in our offshore programs while we couldn't travel to get there. In terms of new products, and it's been mentioned here already, um, the rise and rise of, of non-AQF, we get far greater flexibility in the non-AQF space, the Institute accredited uh, quals, we have the, the freedom and flexibility to be able to tailor to uh, bespoke training. Uh, we spend a lot of time listening to clients, be they educational providers or, or, uh, or industry. Uh, and then I've also just mentioned degrees, and I think that the the the, the space of delivering um, full full degrees offshore um, is one that that uh, is a is a beckoning market for for TAFEs. Um, New markets. Again, we've been doing this market analysis and uh, and discovered that uh, there are other markets that we want to get into, and we've already uh, experienced some success there. Um, we're making our existing partnerships work harder. We're getting, we're getting our existing partners. I would much prefer to do more things with fewer partners in fewer places. And so how we can achieve scale in some of those partnerships is, is of keen interest to, to me, to us. Um, and, and I think that probably the days of having a scattering of bespoke programs with small numbers of students, but in really nice places to visit is probably, uh, is probably gone. Um, the other one, I know we've we've done a lot with industry, with um, education partners offshore, industry partnerships, be they chambers of commerce um, uh, or multinationals or local industry, it is huge. I think there's enormous potential there, and Australia's got a good reputation for high quality delivery. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity in that space. And and the other one, which I think that is probably a little bit um, lacking. Um, for its acknowledgement in things like the international strategy is the is the role of of us as public providers in supporting the skills based recoveries of other countries that have been devastated by COVID. And I think that there's a, uh, a an opportunity there to partner with our uh, our local go our Victorian government, national government, and and to be able to build the skills base of those recovering economies, particularly for st strategically important um, countries. And we've and uh, we heard earlier the, the reference to Indonesia is a very good example there. In terms of threats, COVID uh, still Still very disruptive in some of our uh, uh, key partnership countries uh, offshore. It's also, you know, threatens to disrupt here again. Um, and so I don't think we're in the clear on that one. Uh, the, the economy, the impact of the economy of COVID on the economies of other countries that uh, we typically do some do work with, is there going to be the money there to pay for the training and, and so forth? Um, so we know that that's, that's, a, that's a real challenge. Obviously, we've got a horrible global unrest stuff going on at the moment, and um, uh, and and also we know that it's a really competitive space uh, for international education offshore. Some other bits and pieces that I wanted to to uh, highlight to mention, and, and some of them, as um, as I said earlier, have been already highlighted. I, I, th I think. Um, uh, the role of Elicos and, and um, in our training, we know that there's a the rise and rise of offshore delivery of, of Elicos um, by third party in third third countries. Um, our partnerships with those countries to ensure that the pipeline of, of students comes to us and doesn't go elsewhere is is a real opportunity um, to to progress. Um, we found it very difficult to compete with some of the. Uh, bespoke Elicos providers onshore, the private providers. And so we have actually pivoted to, to spend, um, to partner with them. Um, and, and we do what we do well, and they do what they do well, and uh, and make that uh, make those relationships work. And finally, there I've mentioned packaging and these more innovative programs where it's English for nursing, English for building and so forth. And, uh, and I think there's, there's much more that we could do in, in that space. Um, Helen focused on teacher training, absolutely agree. Um, I think that we can be exporting quality, building capacity uh, else, elsewhere. Uh, and, and things like TESOL don't just teach English, they teach teachers to teach in context. And, and as countries want to rebuild uh, and, and build their VET systems, I think there's enormous opportunity for us, IST, and, and also in higher education skills. What is, what is uh, how to do research in VET and, and so forth. Um, I think there's great opportunity for us in that space too. Um, 
the internationalization piece, it used to be a kind of catchphrase and we used to focus on it uh, a lot. It kind of disappeared uh, during COVID, but uh, but I'm doubling down on it. I, I think that uh, internationalization is a differentiating feature uh, for, for us that can actually enrich our, our student experience, our staff capability, our curriculum, our campus and our communities um, are all enriched through uh, internationalizing our curriculum and our products and services. And, and I've also mentioned there the unbundling and rebundling, which is something I was reading about um, in America. Um, but but the the fact that there's enormous amounts of, of content out there in the world and how do we introduce that content into our programs, do the mapping exercises, give it credit where it's uh, where it's deserved and, and start to really evolve some of those partnerships with other countries. Uh, colleges in other countries such that they're delivering into our programs or or we're sending students and staff off to to uh, experience um, the, in the offshore space. Um, finally, the partnerships and uh, Janelle um, uh, was very clear about the par the partnership benefits between TAFEs. I think that that's a, that's a really important one. We know that sometimes we go into bids against the might of GIZ in Germany, um, but, but as the collective capacity of TAFEs, uh, if we can harness that, then I think that it makes a really powerful proposition um, in, in, in our global competition. Uh, partnerships with industry, and uh, I've spoken about that a little bit before, and then and then with government and getting government to actually work with us and for us to do those G to G relationships such that um, uh, they can give us an entree into uh, delivery uh, uh, offshore. Um, and, and that's getting our trade and investment officers uh, to, to think about um, a VET component every time there's a business opportunity uh, offshore. Finally, I have just listed a few of the things, um, uh, things that I actually think are really significant in the international education strategy as we have it. I absolutely agree on diversification. It's one of the wonderful things about international education um, is that it, it, uh, we have a, a very rich milieu of students. I don't think we're as, uh, as mono um, as some of the university sector, as some of the universities are, but, uh, but increasing diversification of both cohorts and products is I think really important for our resilience. Um, I think that the Meeting Australia's skills needs, uh, and I'll just hark back to the bit I said before about our role um, in, in supporting the skills needs of other countries. I think that's a really important thing there too. And uh, my own personal bent around uh, applied research and innovation. I think there's a huge amount that we can do in the VET space. Um, we don't have a nationally funded um, uh, applied research uh, and innovation program in the VET space like Canada does, for example, but there's still a lot that we can do in collaborating uh, with those folks overseas who do have programs there. Keeping students at the centre, absolutely vital and, and increasing um, their connection to Australian students and communities, really important for both locals and, and the international students. Um, mobility I've discussed, and I do actually, I do so much agree with the need for the reviewing of the systems and processes. And I have whipped through that and that's Thanks, me. Andrew, that Thanks. was great. Yeah, um, apologies, but you did a good job. We do have a couple of minutes left. I'm just going to hand straight over to Eva um, Filipiak, who is the um, TDA Director of International Engagement, just to do a few um, of the Q&A, Eva. Yes, thanks very much. And uh, that was so, so interesting. Many thanks to all our speakers. I think it captures the breadth and uh, the, the, the richness of the opportunities out there. So thank you everyone as, as well to all the participants for all your comments and, and, and your questions. We might not be able to cover them all, um, but I, um, I am tempted to ask the, the one from Ellen Butler, the, the first one on the list about um, the, the Kind of advocacy on behalf of tape so so let me read that one out given the looming 2022 federal election what can we do to advocate for tafe in the provision and governments of international education and training field its expertise along with the variety of contribution it makes and has further potential for in this field so so uh, apologies because of the time i think that will be lindo the only the only question that i'll be able to read out but i think it's an important policy and positioning piece and could i pass that on to janelle a vet expert on the council because i think this is this is such a janelle question that i cannot not direct it to you so over to you janelle thanks eva um as i said um through my presentation you know the ability to promote what tape does i think is really important and and to have that voice on the council is obviously a bonus for us all but it shouldn't be the only avenue you would use. It should be, you know, getting to our local um, 
politicians, to our, our state governments, to our national government, and actually promoting TAFE. We don't do that well. And as long as I've been in TAFE, we have never done that as well as I think we could do. There's some great stories around and great case studies and great success stories, yet not a lot of people really know about what TAFE does and what it can do. So that, to me, would be the most important thing. It's every on everyone in the um, industry to promote what we do as any way they can. Thank you, Janelle. Um, on that note, I would like to thank all four of our speakers today for their time and for sharing their expertise and insights. Thank you to everyone out there who tuned in to, for today's um, TAFE Talks. It's been a really interesting and rich discussion and we look forward to seeing you all again at future events. Thank you.